Um, We are starting a series over the next four weeks that is talking about prayer and talking about the importance of prayer and all the excitement around it. And I remember when Jenny preached just before Advent, she talked about prayer and growing in prayer, and she talked about the, the chapter after the one I'm going to do today in Philippians. And I remember her saying that she knows that we are a people of prayer, that this church, she has experienced prayer through this church. She has experienced people encouraging her. And I would say that that I agree with that, but that God is always calling us to go deeper in our prayer. And I think that there is a place for us to, 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 to grow in the area of corporate prayer, in the area of coming together. I know that there is deep, deep, rich prayer life, personal prayer life that people have, but to be able to, to pray corporately, to be able to seek after God and to desire for him to, to move us all in one direction, I think is so important. And so that's going to be the emphasis over the next few weeks. And we're hoping to kind of culminate the end of it with, um, with a time of kind of corporate prayer and maybe even for some of us fasting, for those of us who can, and just seeking after God for what he will do in and amongst us as a group of people. And so today's text comes from Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 3 and move all the way down to verse 11. And it says this, it says, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God, the word of God. Let's just uh, pray again. God, your word, it's rich, it's powerful, it's true. We don't always see or discern what it's saying, but I pray that you would give us a sense of how you want to use this word to encourage, equip, Brain, rebuke maybe, but help us to always be living lives that give you glory. Amen. Amen. So I imagine, you know, we're entering into the new year, uh, 2022, not 2020 again, but 2022, a new year, a new era, a new thing that God wants to to do in our lives, and I'm sure many of you have been thinking about, okay, this new year, what are some of the things that I want to set as goals? What are some of the things that I want to see happen? And maybe you've given up on New Year's resolutions because you know that most people quit them or they fail within the first six weeks or whatever, but I kind of hope that, you know, even with if that's true, that you've been reflecting and saying, okay, if I was to say this was going to be my best year, I'm going to be my best self, What are some of the things that I would want to put in place in order to ensure that to happen? And I I know that's what I've done as I've been reflecting and just saying, okay, God, what are the areas where you want me to to grow? And not just because I want to um, better achieve, but because I want to become the best person I can possibly be. And I want 2022 to be the best year that I've had so far and for it to be the best year until 2023. And I don't know about you, but I want to keep on getting better. I want to keep on growing. I want to keep on maturing. I want to keep seeing God do more and more in my life. And uh, and I believe, I believe that God can continue to do that. And essentially, that's what we're going to see to some degree in this prayer today. We've decided to, as we're going to be talking about prayer, that we're going to look at prayers as they come up through some of the, uh, the written epistles, some of the letters. So we're going to look at four different ones, four prayers that are kind of there and how they are just incorporated into the group of people. And so even though I've already read the text, we're going to just look at um, the, the first part of this 
scripture that I've read you, and it's really, he, in it, he's giving the reason for why he prays for them or why he's praying for the Philippian church. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for you, always I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And he says, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So what is the reason for the prayer? I mean, part of it is that he's remembering them. The Apostle Paul, at this point in his life, he is in prison. He is in Rome. He's most likely facing trial, which could lead to his execution and ultimately does. And so he is there. He is not the young zealot that he once was. He's not the guy, the missionary, going from place to place and starting churches and, and you know, confronting the, the, the evil in places and, and casting out demons. He, he's a guy who's done all those things, but he's not early on in his ministry. This is the end of his ministry. He, he's the guy who went and planted the church in Philippi. He's the one who gathered people. He saw the first converts. Um, he began to, to plant the church that was hosted through Lydia, a wealthy person. And really, there just becomes this sense that he has a heart for them. And so here he is, years later, decades into his faith. He has seen all kinds of things. He has been persecuted for the gospel. He has been beaten, whipped, stoned. He has been left on a deserted island. <laughs> Like he has experienced all this stuff and through it all, he has seen God be faithful to him to the point where he has been able to share the gospel everywhere that he dreamed he would be able to share the gospel, including in Rome to the officials in Rome as well. And so here he is in the midst of this and he is able to go and to preach the gospel. And he says that as he is doing this, he's remembering them. Now, there's lots of reasons for him to remember them. One, they had an intimate ministry together. He's going to talk about that in a second. But two, we're told in the letter that they have just sent somebody to encourage him while he's in prison and to give him money, money to help buy food. He says money to help spread the gospel, to help get the word out. And so really what he's doing is at this place, he's being reminded that this is a church that has loved him. He's remembering the people that he did ministry with. He's remembering the love that he has for them. And so as he is remembering them, it, it causes him to, to go into prayer. It causes him to reflect. It causes him, he says, to, to pray for them with great joy. <laughs> right? And you know, I'm no longer a youth pastor. I don't know if anybody noticed that. I, I still have people here at this church because I, I was a youth pastor here that still think of me as the youth pastor. But, you know, like, I am no longer this young guy. I have planted a church. I have been a pastor at another church, and I've been here at this church for four and a half years now. And so in that, I know that, that there's been this this breadth of ministry that has happened. And the things that I preached when I first started out are completely different than the things that I'm preaching now because I've experienced, um, you know, God's both hardship, God's encouragement, God's um, pushing and challenging me as well as God giving me joy. But when I stop and I reflect on all of the people that God has brought into my life in all of the places I have been, right? Because when I was in training to become a Salvation Army officer or our seminary, we kind of did a co-op in two other churches. So there's two churches there that we were um, kind of intimate with. There was a church in Winnipeg that we did in the summer. And then there was the church we started in Milton, Langley, and now here. And as I reflect on all of those churches and on all of those people and all of the things that have happened over the years, the other day we had some random person come up on our Facebook page and Deborah on my personal Facebook page, and Deborah said, Bill, the people we have met 
diverse, all kinds of different walks, from the wealthiest of the wealthy people in Canada to the poorest of the poor, and everybody in between. Like, we have had opportunities to walk hand in hand in ministry with these people, and it's incredible. And when I remember them, I'm always filled with affection. <laughs> I'm always filled with love. I, 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 I want to pray all these things for them and pray courage for them and hope for them. And so even though many of those people, like Paul, I'm not talking to them on a daily basis, maybe not even a year like goes by and I haven't talked to them, but there still are people who I'm constantly drawn to. Why? Because we did something together, right? He says that I remember you also because of your partnership in the gospel. When you do something as transformative as gospel ministry with people, they are ever placed in your heart. You remember all the crazy things you did just trying to let people know that you even existed as a church. You know, we were talking about a few weeks ago, the street market here. And I think of all the people who worked on it. I think of Bridie and Steve and just all of the volunteers who, who led and helped out with that and what an incredible event it was and that we didn't know if it was going to work until the, the marching band got up and played and all those people showed up, right? We're like, oh, we don't know if this is going to actually happen in the midst of a kind of snowstorm after one of the biggest snowstorms in the history of British Columbia, right? And all of those people who faithfully worked to put up tents to prepare for that event, like I'm just filled with affection for how they worked. I remember we were in Milton, early days of our church. Nobody even knew we existed. And we decided that we were going to do something similar, a party in a parking lot. And we had a little, the four or five of us who could play brass instruments got some instruments from somewhere, and we were going to play Christmas carols. And it was this just ridiculous, we, had, we were going to roast chestnuts. It was this ridiculous blizzard, and we were at the mall parking lot. We were the only people in the mall parking lot. The eight of us and this photographer from the local paper who came out to take pictures. And I remember the, the newspaper clipping that he did was like, this great event that the Salvation Army did with this great crowd of people. I'm like, he wasn't at the same event as me. <laughs> and I think about the, the faithfulness of, you know, one of my, my dear friends at that moment trying to roast chestnuts over a little propane stove just because she wanted to let people know that we existed as a church. It's ridiculous and amazing. It's beautiful. And so he's saying, I remember that you participated with me in the gospel. And even now, you see the gospel is so important. And my message of reconciliation with God is so important that you're sending money to me in my time of need in order that I might continue to proclaim the gospel. And then he, he says to them, he says, in this, he says, I, I just am praying, I'm praying, and I know that what began in you will continue until it's complete or continue until it's made perfect. There's this idea that he says, when, it, when is that going to happen? When Jesus Christ comes. We'll talk about that in a second. But he says that, that the ministry that started, the, the seed of the gospel that was planted in your heart, the way that I saw you come alive, the way that I saw that you were willing to put your life on the line to go and tell people about Jesus Christ, that I, I know that, that that work that started, that it'll keep on growing and it'll be eventually become complete. And that, that idea of complete or that idea of perfection is that you are so kind of in love with God, so filled with the Holy Spirit that you are able to, to, to stand before him blameless. We're, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes as we continue through the, the prayer. But he says, I know that God is going to do this even without me, right? That God is going to complete the work even if I'm not able to be there to encourage you, even if I'm not able to write you another letter, even if I eventually um, die here in this Roman occupation. He says, I know that God will keep doing the work until you are so full of his love and joy that you are absolutely complete. And he'll do it even without me. We, we move then to what are the desired outcomes of the prayer, and we see in verses 10 and 11. Now, 
you might say, well, wait a second, Bill, we haven't actually heard the prayer. And that's because I thought, well, maybe we would just talk about the end of what he says and what are the outcomes that he believes that God will give. It says this, it says, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So listen, here's all the things that he says, that if this prayer that he prays over them is answered, that they will actually experience, right? He says that, um, I want you to be able to, to make wise decisions, to be able to decide what is best, right? He says, I want you to, to experience this prayer in such a way that you are able to look at a situation and you're able to be able to decide what it is we're supposed to do and you're able to dis- determine between what is a good thing and what is the right thing. W- one of my experiences in church ministry is that often we get um, inundated with a million things that we have to do. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that happened in this kind of COVID experience when everything stopped is you start to reassess and you go, okay, what am, I was so busy before. What of it was actually the stuff that was of value and what of it is the stuff that I was just doing because I was told I had to do it? And so there's, there's this opportunity to pull back and go, oh, okay, maybe I don't want to be that crazy again. And so I got to start deciding what I'm going to do. Now, all of the things I was doing before and all the things that you were doing before and all the things that we were doing as a church are good. But are they the best? <laughs> are they the most important? Are they the things that are going to have, like we talked about on the 26th, um, eternal value? Are they the things that are going to last forever? And if so, those are the things we need to be investing in. And so it's more um, than just doing what is simply good. He says that not only that, I want you to be able to to make wise decisions on those things, but I want to know that you will be actually complete, right? You want to be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ. He's saying, I want to see that your hearts are completely Um, transformed so that when you stand before God, that you are confident that the work is in fact completed. Now, we have just come through Christmas, right? And Christmas, I don't know about you, I have four children, and I have a beautiful wife, and then I have mother-in-laws. Those are the people I typically buy for, and then you have a meal to prepare and all those things. And so those, that month, for some people more than a month, for some of us, the day before Christmas, we're like, I got to figure this out. (laughs) I got to make sure I get all of the perfect gifts. I got to make sure that I I have the food for us to be able to eat. And I have to make sure that, you know, that everything's good. And so you do the work, the work, the work, the work, the work in order for you to be able to have that experience. But there comes a moment, usually it's Christmas Eve about five o'clock. I mean, for me, it's way earlier than that because I'm here usually at the church preparing for the Christmas Eve service. But there comes a point where you can't do anymore because the stores are closed, because you can't go and buy more food, you can't go and buy more presents. You just have to look at what you've done and say, okay, it's complete. And then that means that everything you have is what you give and what you bring. And he's saying that what I want is I I believe that if this prayer is answered in your life, that you can be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ, right? You work, you work, you work up till that moment. But when Christ comes, either through your being promoted to glory, your death, or through him coming as the second time, that when he comes, it's finished. You can't do any more. It's done. The stores are all closed. What you have is what you have, and that's what you have to work with. And he says, when that moment comes, I know that if the prayer that I'm praying over you is answered, that you will be able to stand in front of him and, and be blameless and sincere. Could you have done more if you had more time? Maybe. He says, it doesn't really matter. Because at that moment when Christ comes, if you have been working, if you have been growing, if you have been maturing in this prayer that I have for you, that you'll be able to stand in front of him and it'll be complete. And he'll see that you have been sincere. And he'll see that your heart is right. 
The other thing that he says will happen as a result of this prayer being answered in our lives is that you'll have the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of righteousness is something that God gives to us, right? We are not made righteous on our own. How are we made righteous? We're made righteous because Christ was willing to come and to live the life that we could not live, to die the death in our place, the death that we deserve to die. And then as he rose again, he defeated death and he bestowed on us or he gave to us the gift of him making us clean, clear of our sin, clear of our defects and a clear conscience because of the Holy Spirit, right? And so we are made righteous because of our relationship with God. But the the fruit of righteousness comes as a response to our hearts being changed. As God has transformed us, as God has changed us, there's this thing where we begin to go, okay, well, what does that mean? How do I respond to other people? How do I love the way that God has loved me? And that we begin to say that there's an opportunity for us to to live a right living in order that there might be fruit from it, right? The fruit of righteousness is God's transformation of us into a people who live out his gospel mission in our world. And so uh, the fruit of righteousness does not happen by us simply accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but as us responding to what he has done. And so, sorry, just there was one more thing that I wanted to say. The last thing he says that will happen if this prayer is answered is that God will be given glory over and over and over again through your lives, through our lives, through the lives of the church in Philippi. That as they learn to be a people who walk in righteousness as a result of the righteousness, as they learn to answer or to be the answer of this prayer that he has for them, that ultimately God will be glorified. And so here is the the prayer. Here is the actual prayer that he prays. It's only one verse out of the nine that we read, right? It says this. It says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more and in knowledge and depth of insight. I want to read it again, sorry. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight or in discernment. So he says, your love, as in the love that you have as a group of believers in Jesus Christ. And the word that he used there is agape. So he's saying that your agape love, micro. Now there, many of you will know that there are different words in Greek for love, And we have one word for love, and we use it for absolutely everything. But we understand that when I say, oh, I love my wife, and I love you, that I can sometimes be talking about different things. I love my children, right? In the Greek, they have different words to explain that. The, the kind of most common one would be um, phileo, which is a love that you give to somebody who is kind of a brother or a sister, Uh, a friend, that kind of friendship love. And usually it's a love that you give and that somebody gives back, right? Eros is that kind of romantic love. And Eros only works if I give it and somebody gives it back, okay? But agape love is this kind of God love and it's a sacrificial love. It's, It's a love that doesn't expect or demand reciprocation for it to continue to happen. It doesn't demand that if you don't give me back phileo, I'm going to stop phileoing you, right? I'm going to stop, you know, having that that love for you. It's a love that says, even if you don't love me, I will love you because even though I didn't love God, God loved me and died for me, right? It's this love that says that I'm willing to give myself, that I'm willing to, to, to sacrifice, that I'm willing to pour myself out, that I'm willing to forgive, that I'm willing to not hold something against you, Right? And so you can look at something like 1 Corinthians chapter 13, also written by Paul, and you can say, oh, there is this depth, this picture of love that's incredibly beautiful that is really this action of trusting God. 
And ultimately, Logos love starts at the cross and it flows in and out of us. It starts at the cross because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It starts at the cross because God showed us love first by him being willing to empty himself, by him being willing to die in our place. And that sacrificial love is the love that he poured upon us who did not deserve it, so that we take the same love and we pour it on a group of people who don't necessarily deserve it. He says, I pray that your agape may grow even more and more. He's saying, I, what I'm really praying is that you just love more and more and more. That you grow in this kind of idea of what it is to know God and to be known by God. To actually want to do the thing that God wanted to do when he came to the world. See, God sent Jesus to show us what? To show us the way. To show us love. To show us what it means to be somebody who can be sinless and still be willing to, to never hold something against somebody, to love them so completely, to do all of those things. And so he says, I, I pray that your love would grow more and more and more. And that if we, it's interesting because he could have said the things that I would expect somebody to say for him to say, this is how you're going to be complete. This is how you're going to be mature. I pray that you would know your Bible more and more and more, right? I pray that you would um, pray more and more and more, which ultimately I'm asking you to do as a congregation, right? He's, he could say all of those things to us, that I pray that you would give more, that I pray that you would tithe more, that I pray that you would go and evangelize more. He could say all of that stuff, but instead in what he says is he says, I want you to grow more and more in, your, in love, in that agape, that if that's the thing that's growing inside of you, then you'll be able to do all of those other things because you'll be doing them not out of a duty, but out of love. Now he says this, and I found this interesting because in some translations, they'll, they'll put a comma between this, uh, this word, and then in some translations they don't. And I actually think it's better when it doesn't have the comment between, right? So it says, um, I pray that you would grow in your love even more and more there with knowledge, but actually, if you don't put the comma, grow more and more in your love in knowledge and in discernment, right? It's this idea that I want you to grow in your knowledge of love. I want you to grow deeper in your understanding of what love is that I want you to grow with understanding. I want you to, to, to search through the scriptures so that you can see how I have loved so that you can grow in that same kind of love, that I want you to go into experiences with other people. Sometimes there'll be people who just make you feel good about yourself. Don't we all love being around the Ted Lassos in this world, right? The people who just constantly are speaking positive things over us. We just want to be around people like that, people like Tristan and Hollis, who they just walk in and they just make your life better because they gave you a hug and told you you're great. Right? We just want to be around those people because they bring such courage to us. But, he says, your love can grow as you're around the people who aren't always nice to you, who sometimes make you feel bad about yourself and you're like, oh, I just want to, no, I want to choose to love that person even though it's hard. I want to choose to, to invite them into my life even though they make me feel uncomfortable. I want to choose to grow in my understanding of what it is to be like God. And we know this. We know, know, know this, <laughs> right? That if you really want to love something or someone, the best way to do it is to get to know it. That you can meet people and be like, oh, that's a great person. I love them. They love God. And you can be like, oh, I, I think highly of them. But then when you have a moment where you sit and they begin to share their heart and they tell you their heartbreak, when they tell you the story that led them to this place where they are now sitting with you and sharing with you, that all of a sudden what happens, as you get to know them, your love for them goes deeper. Even though there might be moments where 
you're, you're sad at them or you're angry at the, the decisions they made that led to that place. Always when somebody sh- intimately shares their life with you, what is your response? It's very seldomly rejection. As you get to know somebody, you fall deeper and deeper in love with them. You begin to um, understand that maybe the reason why they respond is because something happened in their past that caused them to do that. And so you grow in your affection for them. Why? Because you're getting to know them. Actually, it's really good advice, right? Because I know that I've been married now for whatever it is, 22 years or something like that. And I know that there have been moments where it's just been all arrows, where I'm just like, oh, she's so great. (laughs) I just feel so good because she's around me. But there are also um, these moments where it has to be agape because we're just in conflict with each other. And if we don't agape each other, if we don't sacrifice, if we don't choose to love one another, our marriage won't last. But I also know that it's very easy for us to get to a point where we think, well, I know you. I've had all these conversations with you. I've talked to you about all of these things. And in that, you kind of are, are just settle. And in the settling, you stop to really love the person. Why? Because they're always changing. Their, their views are changing. Their experiences are changing. Their hopes are changing. Their hurts are changing. Now you're part of the hurts. And that if we want to grow in our love for somebody that we're intimate with, we have to grow in our knowledge of who they are. We have to get to know them again. We have to ask those deep, intimate questions that we stayed up till three or four o'clock in the morning learning when we were first dating. That if we really want to love them in a real way, we have to, to choose to say, how can I know you more? And when you stop wanting to know the other person, you're just like, oh, you're just somebody in my life, your marriage is in a lot of trouble. Even with all of the the brokenness, the ugliness, the failure, it's in knowing the person that you can love them more and more. He says that not only that, but that you would grow in um, insight or discernment, right? That you would have these constant epiphanies of what love is. I mean, when when I was young, I thought love was just somebody who held my hand and smiled at me. (laughs) Right? Oh, I'm in love with them. But as I've grown and matured, I've realized that um, there have been moments in my life where I've been like, oh, I've been trying to love you for years, and all of a sudden I realized that this thing I was doing wasn't actually loving you, it was just meeting my need, and this epiphany happens, and I go, oh my goodness, that wasn't love, so I need to shift in order to love you more, right? That as you begin to to grow in discernment, you begin to go, oh, okay, there's more to love, and that's true of our relationship with God, that as God begins, I don't think God, if God was to reveal to us everything that needed to change in our lives, at the moment of us giving our of um, conversion or giving our lives to him, we would all not be able to do it. We'd be like, oh, that's too much. It's too much. There's too much change that has to happen. But see, God, he's a good lover. He is gracious with you. And he says, I'm going to show you that you need to change this. And sometimes we think that the things that we change right at the beginning are the easiest things. I remember this guy, he was um, a drug addict, He had all of these um, issues, alcohol, everything. Um, He got saved. The day he got saved, he gave up all of that stuff. Boom, all of it. Never drank again, never smoked again, never did drugs again. Gave it all up at conversion. Right? And you're like, whoa, that's amazing. But it was years later that we started to see that, oh, okay, wait a second. He's rude to his wife. He's often angry. You know, like as he began to mature, the stuff that we thought was so miraculous that it could never happen, that was the easy stuff. The the brokenness, the anger, the resentment towards people, that's the stuff that God had to do. That was the deeper stuff. That was the epiphany stuff. That was the growing in discernment and love and him saying, okay, God wants something deeper. God wants me to be more gentle. God wants me to be more gracious. God wants this. And he invited him into something deeper. For many of us, we give glory to the moments where somebody's like, I haven't touched alcohol in 10 years since I met Jesus. But have you gone deeper? Has he changed your heart? 
Is your wife feel more love than she did 10 years ago? Right? Is there, is there a depth? Is there a growth? Is there a maturing? The, the other thing is that um, he's able to help us to discern what is not really love or what is false love, right? As you grow in your love, you start to go, oh, okay, maybe that isn't real love. Just one more thing as we finish this prayer. He says, I pray that your love may grow more and more in knowledge and in discernment. And in that, you will eventually be complete. In that, you will eventually be made right. In that, you will be this. But you notice that even though the subject is there and the verbs are there, there is no object to what he's asking them. He's not like, I pray that your agape towards God would grow so that you are so in love with God that you just give up everything. He doesn't leave it there. He doesn't say, I pray that you would just love yourself so much so that you're willing to do the hard work of making yourself better, of growing and maturing, of being disciplined, of reading scripture, of praying, of exercising, of getting in shape, of all those things that many of us have made as our resolutions for the next year, all those things to self-improve. God wants you to have all of those things. And he says, I want you to grow in your love of self. I want you to grow in your love of God. And he says, and I want you to grow. I want your growth to abound in your love of others. There is no object because he wants to call us to all of it. He says, I want your love to so grow, your agape to so grow, that you are willing to sacrifice yourself for God. You are willing to sacrifice for yourself and you are willing to sacrifice for others. Why? So that as you do that, you can get to the point when it is done, you can't do anything else, that you can stand before God and he can say, I know that you weren't perfect, but I know that you loved me with a love that was ever deepening, that was ever maturing, that was ever loving, that that you loved others more than you loved yourself, that you learned what it meant to be agape. I believe that God wants to do great things amongst us. I believe that God wants to make 2022 into a year where we see miracles happen, where we see God do great things with his people. And I believe that he could take the dozen of us that are here right now and do miracle after miracle after miracle, and it'll touch the hearts of lots of people. Or I believe he can take the hundreds of you who are watching online and that he can move in your life and that he can help you to grow and to mature and that you will see the gospel advance in all kinds of ways. But I believe that the way that is going to happen is if we grow in love. If we grow in our understanding of what it is to really love, if we grow in our knowledge of God, each other, and the neighbors in our worlds, that if we do those things, that there will be miracle after miracle after miracle because we serve a God who wants to lavish what? His love upon us. That while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. That while you were at your worst, he gave his love. We're going to sing this song, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your love, it just chases us and captures us and, and longs for us. God can do anything with the people who are willing to say, I want to grow in love. I want to grow in my knowledge of love. I want to grow in my knowledge of you. I want to grow in my knowledge of others. I want to grow in my knowledge of self so that love may be ever increasing. And so God, we pray, we pray that we would be that people this year, that this would be a year where we grow in our depth of understanding of your love. We grow in the depth of our understanding of loving each other and loving others. That we would see, that we would hear that prayer and that it would be answered, that we would pray it for each other. That we would pray it for each other. Thank you, God. Imagine if that one prayer became our prayer this year. I mean, we're going to talk about at least four more. But that if we were always praying that for each other, that we would grow in our knowledge of God's love and that it would penetrate our very hearts. What an amazing year this year will be. Let's sing together.